Hey you guys, welcome to the seventh episode of the Delora Dabbles podcast. Um, I'm Delora, you can find me on Instagram as Delora Dabbles and obviously here on YouTube. Um, so this week I wanted to talk about some of the projects I have. I haven't gotten too terribly much done considering that um, this is the last week of classes I've got. I've got several papers to write this weekend alone, not even counting next weekend. Um, so I haven't really gotten as much done as I would like to, but I want to show you what I am, what I have done. Um, so I've got this going on. Um, I was going to do an opposing three ply, like what I did for, like what I did for this, but I already have a pretty large, like this is on the larger end of the sample skein spectrum. So I have enough to swatch and play with, with an opposing three ply. So I decided that I wouldn't do an opposing three ply for this project. Um, I would do a larger sample of a crepe ply. So the setup for an opposing three ply is pretty much the same setup for uh, a crepe yarn if you're doing, you know, three plies. So. Basically, the only difference between a crepe yarn and an opposing three ply is the steps you take to actually ply them. You will always have uh, one ball that is S twist or the opposite of what the other ones are, and then you will have all the rest of your balls of singles spun Z twist or whatever you normally twist as. I know that a lot of people they liked for their crepe yarn to end in an S twist. They want all their finished yarns to end in S twist. There's, you could go either way. I have heard that um, some knitters will start to unravel um, anything that's finished twist is Z twist, but not everyone has that problem. So you may or may not have to actually end your plies in an S twist to prevent problems. A lot of times it's just I don't know, it's just one of those weird things. Now I will say that spinning S-twist, um, and I'm all drop spindles here, spinning S-twist is more difficult for me because I'm always spinning Z-twist. And for those of you who um, have forgotten or haven't, um, Z-twist is whenever you spin your spindle or your wheel clockwise, S is whenever you spin it counterclockwise. So anyway, this is a ply ball actually, so you can see that there are two strands coming off of here. Because I did pretty wraps on my Turkish for these, my pretty wraps don't always unravel the way I would like them to. What are you doing, Brad? Yeah, they don't always unravel the way I want them to and they will get tangled, especially uh, towards the end. So I have been um, doing ply balls with it. Now this one is actually a ball it, that this came right off my Turkish just like this and I will link the video down below. It is much faster to wrap this than to wrap a pretty, you know, like, like a God's eye wrap on your Turkish. It's faster, it's more efficient whenever it comes out. It's a nice ball. It unravels very, very cleanly and if you want it to, it can be a center pull ball. Um, for the purposes of what I'm doing to keep the color patterning consistent, I know that I need to unwrap from the outside going into the inside, so I won't be using the center pull on this, but I have wrapped, sorry, Brad is very distracting, um, <clears throat> he's getting a little spunky right now. Uh, so I have unraveled this from the inside, I have done a two ply with one of these in the past, but um, anyway, yeah, so I'm just going to double ply these two. And then I'm going to ply them with my S twist. Because whenever, because these are spun Z, so I'm plying them S. These and this finished ply is both going to be S twist. So then whenever I ply these together, I will spin them Z twist and I will end with a Z twist yarn. So hopefully that didn't sound too complicated. But that's what I've got going on there. <clears throat> and you guys saw this last time. So again, this was an opposing three ply. I rather like it. What I'm working on right now, and I believe I left 
I left my Turkish in the bedroom. One moment. I will be doing um, a project in depth on this. Just because um, it really shows the color, like spinning for color work and manipulating um, your spins to adhere to a certain color work. So what I have here, and you guys will probably recognize this as the um, 100 gram skein of Cheviot that I dyed a while back. Well, what I did was I split... I split the Cheviot in twos, and this is all going to be in the Project In Depth video of how I split it, when I split it, where I split it. Um, but basically I split it in half, and then I split that, you know, each of those halves into thirds, so that I have six little braids. I'm doing this in a three-ply, that's why I broke them up into thirds. I split my roving in half because I want to do a pair of something. Depending on the yardage, I will either do a pair of gloves or a pair of socks. So I am actually doing two different skeins of this project. So I'm not gonna get one big skein of the yarn I need. I'm gonna get two skeins, and each skein is gonna be for each sock or each glove. So these are gonna be three plied. Oh, these are all together. These are part of what I'm spinning. <laughs> I am keeping my sections separate just so that I know which one is which. So this Cheviot is actually spinning up very nicely. This is my first uh, spin of the Cheviot. Because I haven't gotten my wheel yet, I decided to go for the 100 gram uh, batch of fiber instead of my 120 gram batches of fiber, which are pretty huge. Since I am doing this on a spindle. And I will say that this is drafting so nicely um, with the Cheviot. And this is my first time spinning Cheviot particularly. So I'm really happy with that. So yeah, I'm going to three-ply these. I'm starting off spinning the yellow because I'm going to do a ball just like this one. This is how I'm going to wrap my Turkish from now on. Because the pretty wraps just take too long. It I get too obsessed with it as well. Like my... My already obsessive nature kind of takes a deep dive when I'm doing the pretty wraps. This enables me to wrap faster, more efficiently. The ball does not get as tangled as a pretty wrap. The pretty wraps, the top layers will peel off really badly. And even if you pull from the center, they it, you'll sometimes get the clumps coming out at one time. Um, which is almost as bad as the tops peeling off because then you get a clump at one time. You never want to have, when you're applying, especially on a drop spindle, you don't want clumps coming off of your ball. You just want your ball to be able to roll around freely and not get clumps coming off. And that's what this wrap does. So it's quicker, more efficient. It's not as pretty. It's probably not going to give me the Instagram likes, but I don't have the time to worry about that. That's not on my list of priorities, the Instagram likes. So all of these will be spun in balls. Whenever I go to ply these, I am going to ply, so I'm spinning my singles from yellow to black, but I'm going to ply from black to yellow. If you'll notice, my yellow is quite a bit longer than my black, but I also want to preserve more of the black because yellow is my least favorite color. So whenever you are applying a gradient, you know that no matter how consistently you spin and no matter how consistently you split your rovings, there will always be a little bit left over. Where this, this, this spun yarn might be a little bit shorter than this, and whenever you ply these together, you'll have some waste coming off of the longer one. That's always going to happen. I would rather preserve the black then preserve the yellow because I, I really like the, the black color more than the yellow color. So that's why I'm doing it that way. And hopefully this, um, this spin will come out really, really nice. I'm very much looking forward to it. And again, this Cheviot is spinning up quite nicely in a very thin yarn because what I'm going for is a three-ply fingering. And I think I've got my single exactly where it needs to be. 
And I think you guys can see, let me put it up against my arm here. I think you guys can see how thin that is. And I just want to show you guys how easy it is to spin from this roving of Chevy Yacht. Because it drafts very nicely. So I'm doing, I'm doing um, a long draw here. Let me put that over here. I'm doing a long draw. So I'm just kind of letting the fiber hold the weight of the spindle, which isn't going to be difficult because I've only got uh, as heavy as 19 grams. So my spindle's never going to get so heavy that it wants to drop from the fiber. So I can very, very easily draft this out and not worry about anything breaking. But because my spindle is so light, it's going to... Um, have more of a chance to spin back on itself. That's the only thing with lighter spindles that happens. So now I'm testing my twist, and this is, um, that's a pretty soft twist, I think, good enough for a, um, a three-ply. So I'm gonna wind on. And there's really no muss and fuss. So what I just finished spinning singles for over here, that light green color, that's merino roving that I dyed. And I actually kettle dyed it. And I don't prefer to kettle dye my fiber anymore uh, because I get a lot of neps and noils in the roving. So even as I was spinning this, and this is a very nice, pretty consistent, smooth yarn, because I picked up, I picked out all the neps and noils in it, but there were quite a lot because I kettle dyed it and I wasn't as gentle as I probably should have been. But whenever I oven dye something, it's always very gently dyed. Um, and there are very, very little to no neps or noils that I get off of the roving. So like these don't have any neps or noils. You can see these are very clean, nice braids. This one did not make a very nice, clean braid. And I will tell you that um, with, with absolute honesty. Um, I'm not going to do any fancy opposing three-ply with this. I'm just going to do a regular three-ply because um, after spinning this, and I've spun quite a few singles, um, S-twist, I don't enjoy doing it on my spindle. It's um, It comes out a little bit more inconsistent than my Z-twist. My Z-twists are almost always very consistent. So whenever I was spinning in the opposite direction, for some reason that was still bothering me like it was airplane so for some reason spinning the spinning my spindle in the opposite direction threw my whole groove off I think and um, made this come out a little bit thicker thin and I know that some people so here obviously I've been spinning Z twist and I go like this you know and I, I do my long draw stuff some people, whenever they want to spin S-twist, they will completely change their arms. So they will hold the fiber in this hand, on this arm, in this hand. They will twist with this hand because your, your right hand and your left hand want to mirror each other. There's a reason why, like, um, there was that lady on the chalkboard. She was able to write a perfect mirror image of her name just by doing both of her hands at the same time. Think of it like that. Um, so you can spin a very nice Z twist. I mean, I mean, you can spin a very nice S twist with your left hand. If you are good at spinning with your left hand, I've tried that method, and my left hand just doesn't want to do it. But I know that it works for other people. So I would give that a try, other than trying to continue to, to go like this and then spin your spindle this way and keep drafting. If that gives you problems, try the other way. Everyone has something different that works for them. So yeah, that is the current project. And like I said, there will be a huge project in depth video on um, this fiber here. Knitting wise, what I'm working on is this hat. So I will be putting a progress marker here for uh, to show you next week my progress on it. And this is my hand spun, you will recognize it. And look how nice that is knitted up. Now this is a very inconsistent color pattern repeat because of the way that the Rolex looked. And you'll remember that I showed you guys last time how the Rolex um, would have looked for this one in the gray. 
and I think I will show you guys again. So I did kind of like some of the art roll lags that I see on Instagram where they're kind of just like a little bit of all the colors are not it's not a gradient it's just very random so that's how I decided to do my roll lags I decided to do them very randomly and the color repeats that came out of this you can actually see it in the you can like, you know, this hat is, is certainly acting like a swatch for the color pattern repeat, but it just looks so nice and so like controlled chaos. Because I did really long pattern repeats of this, uh, and this is, this is even Navajo ply, so that makes my color pattern repeats even shorter, but I'm really glad I Navajo plied it because you see that this stretch right here is three stitches long, this stretch of pink is three whole stitches, three whole rows of stitches long. If I had not Navajo applied this, for one, this wouldn't all be pink, and for two, that color pattern would be way, way longer. So I'm really liking the way that this has, is turning out, has turned out. The fabric is so nice because this has merino with a little bit of silk. It's not a lot of silk. It's just a little bit of silk. Um, but it certainly has this feel and this quality to it that some of my other knitted fabrics haven't had. And I'm not spinning it in the absolute tightest gauge. So whenever I hold it like this, it's a fabric, right? It's a very nice fabric. When I hold it like this and I stretch it out, you can kind of see that it's not as tight of a fabric. It's more on the loose side without being a loose fabric, but it still has this nice stretch and this nice give. I like the size of the hat so far. I like a nice, um, not too tight hat. No one wants a really tight hat. So if everything goes well, this will actually be going into my stock for my Etsy shop when I get that going. So I'm not actually spinning this for me, I'm spinning this for the Etsy shop. And I think it'll be a really nice piece to go in there. So um, as far as spinning goes, I haven't been particularly spinning technical because you know last week I was showing you guys this wonderful beast of all of my, of all of my stuff. And um, it was nice to show that off, and I, I hope I didn't bore you guys to tears. I hope I inspired y'all to organize your own stash or give you uh, an idea of how to organize your own stash because I know that for me, furniture is very expensive. I wouldn't have been able to afford a bookshelf big enough to fit everything. Uh, so for me, the, um, the cube storage was the best option. It might not be the best option for you, but I hope that that helped you guys. Uh, as far as working with my hand spun and having read some of the stuff from the Alden Amos Big Book of Hand Spinning. I have been absolutely devouring that book any spare chance I get. So I was under the, the impression that this was an Iran weight. And if you'll notice, even with my alpaca cowl, I thought that that was a bigger weight of yarn than it was. Well, Alden Amos goes through how to actually work a WPI gauge, and I've seen videos on how people do it, and they've never explained it as well in a video as this man, this brilliant man, has done in his book. You really want to wrap it as close to it, not tight, you don't want to put tension on the yarn, but you want to squeeze the yarn to see how many wraps you can get in that inch. Another thing is, is that I've been using a ruler and he explains why just using a ruler isn't good enough. You need, you know, you know, you need something on either side of that one inch to hold and compress the yarn together. Otherwise, you're not going to get an accurate gauge. And whenever he said if you use a ruler, you're always going to get a bigger yarn than what you actually have. That was very true. It's been true of all of my stuff. I have always gotten bigger 
bigger WPIs than what my yarn actually is. So I will be investing in a proper WPI gauge soon. And I want one that is the inch cut down out of the wood. But I also want one of the ones that is um, the chart. Like it'll be, I've seen them where they're clear plastic with black lines or frosted lines or some kind of lines on them. And you'll, you can actually line your yarn up onto the gauge and see which line it fits and get a rough estimate. And so if I do both of those, I will have a far more accurate reading because I cannot tell you guys how many times, um, anytime I've cast it on with my hand spun, I've always had to go down a needle size or make the pattern bigger somehow every single time because I've been thinking that I've been spinning bigger yarn than I have. So. That is a huge tip for you guys, I think, uh, and some mistakes of mine to learn from. I was hoping that I wouldn't have to invest too much into the knickknacks. I was being cheap and lazy by just using my ruler. So reading and seeing and having someone tell me, oh yeah, if you just use a ruler, your yarn's going to come out as if it were fatter than it was, and that's going to mess you up. And I'm like, huh, my yarn has been coming out fatter than it is, and I've been using a ruler. This guy might be onto something, you know? So, um, yeah, those, those things are apparently very necessary. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm thinking, though, that this is going to be a pretty quick spin because I'm doing, I'm doing less than 20 gram increments at one time, which can really feel like it'll fly by because you're constantly taking um, balls off your Turkish and you're getting that gratification of, ah, one down, five to go, two down, four to go, you know, and whatnot, that um, it kind of motivates you to keep going and to go further and faster. So. Hey guys, so I apologize for the noise. I've closed all of the windows and stuff. I've had to turn on some uh, additional lighting uh, because someone wants to fucking mow their lawn. <laughs> um, anyway, so as I was saying, I want to start doing a word of the day because I know that if you're a new spinner or if you're a spinner like me who tends to self-isolate, I don't have a community of friends who spin, um, I am a very outgoing person. It's just I do tend to want to just come home and not talk to anyone for days. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't have a huge community of people that can explain terminology to me all the time, so I want to do a word of the day, because all these books that I've been just consuming, I've come across a lot of really awesome words that I would like to share with, um, other people. So the word of the week this week is, whenever spinners use the, use the term a make, or a make of yarn. So a make is... When you're talking about spinning, and I will use my spindle for demonstration, obviously. If you're on a wheel, um, it would be the wheel. But it is the arm's length at which you are spinning at one time. So, when I get to a certain point here, usually whenever my spindle hits the ground, so we'll see how long that takes to do. There we go. This, my friends, is a make of yarn. This is one make. And I also want to talk about some people get very, very technical with um, spinning devices and how they list spinning devices so I want to talk about that more next week and talk about the different types of wheels obviously I won't have any um, experience based things to say but I will be able to share with you guys from the different books I've read what different wheels do what different wheels are called and how they're classified I think that would be a really fun thing to do but there is a term around whether or not your spinning tool, and this applies to spindles, 
spindle wheels like the Charka and Flyer Bobbin wheels. So a drop spindle is a discontinuous device. It is a discontinuous spinning device because you're spinning, you're spinning, and then you have to stop and wind on. The same is true of the Charka up here. Uh, you, you spin and spin and then you stop. And actually you have to rewind on this one. So you have to, you have to roll the opposite way and then you roll again that way. And if you look at my Charka video, you'll see me doing that and how I explain how to use a, a Charka, how to use, you know, and that's basically how you're going to use any spindle wheel or any great wheel is the same as how you're going to use a Charka like this. These are all discontinuous spinning devices. Flyer and bobbin wheels, the traditional wheels that you see and the wheel that um, I will be getting soon is a continuous spinning device because you don't need to stop spinning in order to load your yarn. So I thought that was cool. I was not aware of that terminology and I figured that would be fun to just throw in also with the word of the week. So because I'm probably going to run out of books soon, FYI, so I want to start doing something else. Because um, after, after I've exhausted all the books in the library, I'm not going to go out and buy all of these books. I don't think I'll have the, the money to do that. So, Although I have bought a book, but that's a surprise for a later date. The book of the week is The Intentional Spinner by Judith McKenzie. I know that a lot of people have talked about this book. A lot of people like this book. Um, and I will say with confidence that this doesn't market itself as an all-in-one book. It markets itself as a way to spin with more intention, hence the title. But it's actually a very good all-in-one book to spinning because if you go all the way to the beginning, her introduction um, chapters are... Like she talks all about cellulose fiber, she talks about the historical preparation of flax, which is very fascinating. Um, she talks about protein fibers, wool, alpaca, yak, cashmere. She even talks about pygora, which is one of those lesser known uh, luxury breeds. Um, do, do, do. Angora rabbits, um, vicuña. Um, all kinds of all kinds of good stuff and um, obviously silk the difference she also talks about the difference between Tessa silk and Bombix silk and um, and Bombix is also um, uh, yes I had to double check Bombix silk is another name for mulberry silk or cultivated silk and things like that. She even talks about spider silk, which is interesting. Um, and then, you know, she talks about manufactured textiles and all of that before she gets into the science of spinning, yarn count. Um, and she's got some really great charts. And I know that you won't be able to really get a good view of that chart but the charts are very nice to have I like I like charts she has uh, spinning techniques so drafting methods uh, yarn preparation methods she talks about true worsted and true woolen which I've already spoken about several times she talks about plied yarns novelty yarns she even has something called frosted yarn in here which I have not seen in any other book yet um, she talks about encasement yarns which I believe the spinners guide to yarn designs talks about encasement yarns but she calls them something different um, she talks about she kind of talks about how to design a yarn based on crimp and micron and uh, elasticity and twist, but it's not... She basically tells you what all of these things are, the crimp, the elasticity, and stuff like that. She doesn't really go into too much detail of how to throw all of that stuff together to suit your needs, but I suppose if you read this, 
and you know how all of those things interact, you don't need someone to tell you what to do for a specific project, but I do thrive on examples and I like for someone to actually tell me how these things interact instead of just telling me what all these things are. But I bookmarked this page here because this is all about how, this is a chart on how to adjust the spinning wheel. And I know from that far distance, you won't actually be able to read these super tiny words. So that's why I'm showing it to you guys. But it is an entire flow chart going all the way from up here to down here on the best way to adjust your wheel. So if your yarn is too big, what do you do? If your yarn is too thin, what do you do? If your yarn keeps snapping, what do you do? If your yarn keeps drifting apart, what do you do? Um, and she outlines it all here. I've taken extensive pictures of it. She also has a smaller diagram here that kind of has like, these are like the size of different worlds. You'll see that these worlds get larger and larger as you go along. The only criticism I have of this is that she doesn't give you an example of the world ratios in this chart. So she wouldn't say that, you know, oh, this is a 40 to 1, this is a 20 to 1, this is a 12 to 1, 6 to 1, 5 to 1, 2 to 1, whatever. You know, she doesn't give you the ratio. She just tells you, you know, like over here, like your really, really small worlds are good for cotton and, sil and silk and woolen spun things. And then all the way over here, it's good for applying and novelty yarn, the biggest whirl. So I guess that's cool. I guess maybe that's not necessary. And I'm just being a little nitpicky, but that's fine. Um, she also has this diameter here where she says that like, you can control your wheel very nicely and you won't have to change your drafting method, your drafting speed, or your treadle speed at all, but you can get all these different range of yarn and you're not changing anything that you are doing, you're only changing the wheel, kind of your, your, your drive band ratios, your whirl, and your tensioning, and you can make all these different sizes of yarn without actually changing anything that you are physically doing to the fiber. You're just letting the wheel do all of the all of the change and all of the work. So I like her projects in here. I don't see myself um, making these projects, but if you read them, she especially um, in her woven section. She will tell you how to wet finish a piece of woven fabric. So this is a book on spinning. It's all about spinning. But in her project section, even if you're not interested in the projects, if you read through the notes and you read through the finishing um, section of these projects, you will learn quite a lot about finishing uh, different kinds of fabrics, woven or knitted, finishing different um, types of fiber in th that are in the finished fabric, so how you would finish a cotton versus a wool textile. She also talks about spinning a hemp boucle. So this is before one of her projects. This whole page is just tips on how to spin a hemp boucle that she then uses for a project later on. As you will remember, I have um, a little bit of hemp back there. So that would be interesting to use, I think, finally. Have something to do with it um, and maybe do a boucle with it. So that'll be cool. So yeah, The Intentional Spinner by Judith McKenzie. Pretty good book. It's well written. I know that um, last week I talked about A Fine Fleece by Lisa Lloyd and there were some glaringly obvious problems. And then there was the, the, the combined fact that she wasn't a confident writer. Judith McKenzie is a very confident writer, so just from a writer standpoint, I can appreciate um, how thorough but concise uh, Judith McKenzie can be. That really shows that she knows what she's talking about, she's confident about what she's saying. So she, that, that confidence means everything to a reader, because they feel like they can trust you, it builds reader trust. Uh, which Lisa Lloyd, I think, really failed to do with me when I read it. So yeah. And I will say that the Alden Amos book, 
should be up for review next week. I should have it uh, completely read by next week, hopefully. And um, he is very funny in this book. So his footnotes are funny. He gets, he can be overwhelming. And I do believe I said that last week, but he can be overwhelming. Um, there's a lot of mathematical stuff that he has thrown in there. Sometimes I skim through it, especially if it's dealing with a wheel. And I don't have that much experience with a wheel to understand the mathematics he's talking about. But I think after I get the wheel and I play with it and then I go back and reread those sections, I will glean much more information off of those. But for the most part, I am most way through the book. He's a very funny writer. Um... It's a very dry sense of humor, so you might not catch it in the first chapter, but after after you're done with the first chapter, you'll be like, ah, this guy's being funny, okay. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great book. I'm really enjoying it, so I can't wait to share it with you guys. And um, hopefully next time everything will go according to plan. Maybe I'll have some of these projects done. <laughs> and um, be able to, I don't know, boast about it a little bit. Look what I did, look what I finished. Not just look what I've started, but look what I've finished. And um, I'll talk about the different kinds of wheels. And I'm not just gonna talk about the different kinds of bobbin flyer wheels. I also wanna talk about the different kinds of uh, driven spindle wheels. So I hope to see you next time for that, and uh, in the meantime, happy crafting, and bye-bye.